Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here, fellow Baker Street Irregulars. Um, tonight is very special to me for, for a number of different reasons, um, uh, but mainly because uh, uh, Michael Jurda is one of those people who absolutely gets, in my view, uh, what we're all about in the public library. Uh, uh, we're about the joy of reading. And his books, uh, uh, his reviews in the Washington Post, his books, uh, his books about books um, are, are among the, the best uh, incitements to reading uh, that, I, that I know. He gets the magic, the enchantment. Uh, uh, he, he has a, a, a line, we, this book essentially on Conan Doyle is, is, is what, how, how a, a young boy, in, in this case particularly a boy, but I think this applies to, to girls as, as well, comes to the enchantment, the magic of reading. He talks about books that retain uh, their magic. And, 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 and this book is magical enough that it sent me off. I, I, I'd read a children's version of The Count of Monte Cristo. I'm now deep into the, the, the actual book. Um, and uh, and I, I found a use for my e-reader, finally, uh, <laughs> by, by, by downloading uh, the, the adventures of Brigadier Gerard, the Conan Doyle stories about the uh, Napoleonic uh, French officer. Uh, it was 11.30 at night. The dusty bookshelf in Lawrence was not open. Uh, I needed to read it after, after reading Michael's uh, description of these, of these stories, which is so, uh, so great. Um, you know, uh, it, it, great, there, there is great literature, but how we come to literature uh, is, is, I think, all about telling the story. Um, and, uh, and, and the enchantment, the magic of the, of the first stories that grip your imagination when you're younger. And, and Conan Doyle is for a lot of us, of course, Sherlock Holmes is for a lot of us where that happens. Um, and then, of course, coming back to Conan Doyle and coming back to a lot of the books that we, re we read as children in middle age and in later mm -hmm. age, uh, or advanced age in my case, um, uh, is, is part of the joy uh, of reading because the really great ones actually get better with age, as Michael describes uh, in this book. And as he quotes Sherlock Holmes to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Watson, education never ends. But really, it's, I think, uh, enchantment uh, never ends. Uh, he, he, he's, he, he's wonderful about the details of this, the, uh, the observance of uh, trifles, uh, as I think Holmes, Holmes himself uh, uh, says, uh, is, is what detectives do. It's also what a great literary detective like Michael uh, does. Uh, he loves, as, as I think all of us do, all those great stories that Conan Doyle never wrote about, that, but that are dotted, all the stories that Watson talks about, the adventures that are dotted through the, the stories that we never quite hear about, the whole story of the politician, the lighthouse, and the cormorant, or my particular favorite, the terrible death of Crosby, the banker. <laughs> Um, but there, there's also, I think, in all, all of these, uh, these great books of romance of, of our youth, the quality of the knight errant uh, uh, who's, who's come, come to, to save us or the damsel in distress or the country or the castle or, or whatever it is from whatever dragons are, are, are assailing us. And sometimes those are dragons of boredom, uh, sometimes they're, uh, they're dragons of politics or uh, the angst of living in the modern world, uh, deciding which e-reader to buy, uh, who knows what the dragons might be. But we need our knight errants, and the knight errant of, uh, uh, of book criticism uh, is here with us tonight uh, to dispel our longers and to fight the dragons with us. So, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Durda. Thank you, Frank, for the uh, introduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of this book and maybe read a little bit of it. But I hope that you will all have questions. I've found that the question period for most of these sorts of events is the best part. So I'm going to try and keep myself from talking too long, which is hard enough as it is, in the hopes that you all have questions about Arthur Conan Doyle or about Sherlock Holmes or about the Baker Street Irregulars or maybe even about uh, book reviewing or some wide subjects. Uh, and we'll have, a, I think, a pleasant hour together. There are also books afterwards. I'd be happy to sign them. It's a wonderful book. It fits in your pocket. Great stocking stuffer. You know, and fits in a purse. It's short. And it's what, it's what book reviewers are never supposed to say about books. I hope it's kind of charming. It's supposed to be an entertaining book in itself, but also an invitation to read the Sherlock Holmes stories if you've never read them, 
and if you have read them, to go beyond them and to explore some of the other wonderful books by Arthur Conan Doyle, which there are many. And I'll talk about a bit of, of some of them. First of all, let me talk about how I came to write this book. I was at Princeton for a uh, roundtable on reviewing, and the editors of the Princeton University Press asked me if I might be interested in contributing to a series called Writers on Writers, in which various people are asked to write book-length essays about a favorite literary figure, someone important in uh, their lives. Um, this appeals to me because I'm not really a scholar. I am kind of an old-fashioned critic, an old-fashioned bookman, an appreciator more than a, a slash-and-burn uh, dissector of books. And so the prospect of just writing about the pleasure of one author in, in my life uh, very much appealed to me. The book has a kind of autobiographical arc. It begins with me discovering Sherlock Holmes in fifth grade. And I thought I might read that section about how I came to know Mr. Sherlock Holmes. So I'll read a little bit. It's only a couple of minutes, and I'll be back talking in a moment. The Hound of the Baskervilles, 1902, by the way, by Arthur Conan Doyle was the first grown-up book I ever read, and it changed my life. Back in the late 1950s, my fifth grade class belonged to an elementary school book club. Each month, our teacher would pass out a four-page newsletter describing several dozen paperbacks available for purchase. I remember buying Jim Kelgard's Big Red in a thriller called Treasure at First Base, as well as Jeffrey Household's Mystery of the Spanish Cave. I lying on my bed at home, I lingered for hours over these newsprint catalogs, carefully making my final selections. I had to. Each month, my mother would allow me to purchase no more than four of the 25 and 35 cent paperbacks. Not even constant wheedling and abject supplication could shake her resolve. What do you think we are, made of money? What's wrong with the library? After Mr. Jackson sent in the class's order, several weeks would pass, and I would almost but not quite forget what books I had ordered. Then in the middle of some dull afternoon, probably given over to the arcane mysteries of addition and subtraction, a teacher's aide would open the classroom door and silently drop off a big, heavily taped parcel. Whispers would ripple up and down the rows, and everyone would grow restive, hoping that the goodies would be distributed that very minute. Sometimes we would be made to wait an entire day, especially if the package had been delivered close to the 3 o'clock bell when school let out. Romantic poets regularly sigh over their childhood memories of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower. But what are daisies and rainbows compared to four sleek and shiny paperbacks? After more than 30 years as a literary journalist, I have seen and reviewed new books aplenty. But ah, then, back then, at my wooden school desk, etched with generations of student initials, I would methodically appraise each volume's artwork and read and reread its back cover, carefully investigate the delicate line of glue at the top edge of the perfect bound spines. Afterwards, I would glance around, sometimes with barely suppressed envy, to survey the gleaming treasures on the desks nearby. Certainly no rare first editions have ever been so carefully handled and cherished as those apparently ordinary book club paperbacks. To this day, I can more or less recall the newsletter's capsule summary that compelled me to buy The Hound of the Baskervilles, as if that ominous title alone weren't enough. Beneath a small reproduction of the paperback's cover, depicting a shadowy something with fiery eyes crouching on a moonlit crag, blazed the thrilling words, what was it that emerged from the moor at night to spread terror and violent death? What else, of course, but a monstrous hound from the bowels of hell? Eager as I was to start immediately on this almost irresistible treat, I staunchly determined to put off reading the book until I could do so under just the right conditions. At the very least, I required a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and the utter absence of distracting sisters and parents. Finally, there came a Saturday in early November 
When my mother and father announced that they would be visiting relatives that evening and the girls would be going along. Yes, I might stay at home alone to read. The afternoon soon grew a dull metallic gray, threatening rain. With a dollar clutched in my fist, I pedaled my red Roadmaster bike to Whalen's drugstore, where I quickly picked out two or three candy bars, a box of Cracker Jack, and a cold bottle of Orange Crush. After my family had driven off in our new 1958 Ford, I dragged a blanket from my bed, spread it on the reclining chair next to the living room's brass floor lamp, carefully arranged my provisions near to hand, turned off all the other lights in the house, and crawled expectantly under the covers with my paperback of the hound, just as the heavens began to boom with thunder and the rain to thump against the curtained windows. In the lowering darkness, I turned page after page, more than a little scared, gradually learning the origin of the dreaded curse of the Baskervilles. At the end of the book's second chapter, you may recall, the tension escalates unbearably. Holmes and Watson have just been told how Sir Charles Baskerville has been found dead, apparently running away from the safety of his own house. Their informant, Dr. Mortimer, pauses, then adds hesitantly that near the body he had spotted footprints on the damp ground. A man's or a woman's, eagerly inquires the great detective, to which question he receives the most thrilling answer in all of 20th century literature. Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. I shivered with sheer fearful pleasure, scrunched further down under my thick blanket, and took another bite of my Baby Ruth candy bar, as happy as I will ever be. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it all began. Uh, this, this book goes on to trace kind of the trajectory of my, my lifetime involvement with Conan Doyle. From there, I went on to the local branch library where they had one book by Arthur Conan Doyle, but it was the right book. It was the Doubleday edition of the complete Sherlock Holmes stories with a famous introduction by Christopher Morley. Christopher Morley, as I was later to learn, was with his two brothers, Frank and Felix Morley, uh, the founders of uh, the Breaker Street Irregulars. This is a, a sodality, a club that began in the 1930s and was intended for people who were really fanatical about the Sherlock Holmes stories, who knew them inside out in the way that the three Morley brothers did and had since childhood. You had to pass a quiz on very you know, arcane details. And if you, if you did, you were invited to have, you know, have lunches with uh, Christopher Morley. And this gradually morphed into a regular uh, organization that's continued now for more than 75 years. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a, an organization that's devoted to what's called playing the game, the game being the convention that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are not fictional characters. They really lived. That while these are historical records of their adventures together, there may be you know, discrepancies and problems in the, in the stories, but they can be worked out. They can be uh, through assiduous scholarship, harmonized, and you can create a chronology of a great detective's life and career. Um, many people have been members of the, of the Baker Street Irregulars, the, the great uh, detective story novelist Nero, uh, Rex Dowd, who created Nero Wolf. He was a member, he, he gave a famous paper in the 1940s at the BSI banquet called Watson Was a Woman, in which he proved that Watson was in fact a woman. Um, Dorothy Sayers was a member of the, the uh, Sherlockian uh, Society, the equivalent in, in England, the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. And um, Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman were both members of the BSI. Uh, to become a member is, uh, is, is, if you're a fan, a great honor. There are local, local groups uh, devoted to uh, Sherlock Holmes and Watson. They're called Scion Societies. And they exist in most of the big cities. The one in Washington, which was founded in the 1950s, is called the Red Circle, um, which when giving a, when one of the stories, but giving a name, the Red Circle, to a, a Sherlock Holmes group in, in 1950s Washington was fairly daring. Uh, it, it continues to this day. Um, 
And, uh, but I, wasn't, I didn't know that I was going to become involved with the Baker Street Irregulars quite yet. Uh, from boyhood, I went on to read the, the next book that most people who know about Arthur Conan Doyle read, the famous novel, The Lost World, the story of uh, Professor George Edward Challenger and his expedition up the Amazon River into the jungles of South America to discover a plateau, a uh, lost plateau, where dinosaurs still roam the earth. This, of course, has later been adapted uh, for you know, Jurassic Park and other, other kind of uh, films. It's a wonderful adventure story, and there are several other uh, novels and short stories about Professor Challenger. Then in high school, I started reading anthologies, as many of us do, of ghost stories and supernatural stories. And you would run across tales by, by Arthur Conan Doyle, because he was, in fact, one of the great Victorian masters of the supernatural story. Captain of the Pole Star, uh, The Ring of Thoth. The Ring of Thoth and Lot 249. Um, I think that's the number. I get the number wrong sometimes. Or sort of the origin of the, um, the film, The Mummy, the idea of the revivified mummy coming back. They all, all trace themselves back to uh, these stories by Conan Doyle. And he was, a, he was a marvelous writer. But then I went off to college and sort of forgot about him for a while except for the fact that I uh, discovered that T.S. Eliot, who I was reading, was a great fan of Sherlock Holmes. And if you read his poems and his plays, he's constantly alluding to, to the Holmes stories, both in uh, Murder, in the, uh, Murder in the Cathedral, for example, has an exchange with Beckett and the Tempter that's very much like the Musgrave Ritual, one of the uh, earliest uh, cases of uh, Sherlock Holmes. When I, when I came to Washington, I worked at, I've been working at Bookworld well, which doesn't exist quite as Bookworld anymore. The, the, the section was a standalone tabloid for 25 years. Uh, it was dissolved a couple of years ago, and the books, book reviews are dispersed through the paper. But when I was there, I used to have a column uh, where I would write about books in any way I wanted to encourage people to read. And I would occasionally mention Conan Doyle or P.G. Woodhouse or G.K. Chesterton, favorite writers. And one day I got a call from a guy named John Lellenberg, John Lullenberg is from Kansas City, as I later learned. But he invited me out to have, uh, to have dinner, and we, we talked. And it turned out he was the representative of the Conan Doyle estate in North America, as well as a great Sherlockian and the historian of the Baker Street Irregulars. He's written five volumes of history of the BSI and its activities. Well, the long and the short is that he eventually uh, contrived to have me invited to give a talk. Uh, at the annual birthday banquet of the Baker Street Irregulars. And, and I, this was a great honor for me, and I was tickled, and I talked about Sherlock Holmes. But at the end of my talk, I, I played a version of the game. I told you about the game, and I mentioned that the three Morley brothers established the BSI, so bear that in mind. And at the end of the final problem, you will remember that Holmes and his arch enemy, Professor Moriarty, are at the Reichenbach Falls, grappling above the, above the torrents below, and they both tumble to their deaths. Or so the world believed for many years. It was seven years before Holmes, uh, Conan Doyle wrote another story about Sherlock Holmes, and that was The Hound of the Baskervilles. And he said it as a pre-Reichenbach Falls adventure. So he'd been wanting to get rid of Sherlock Holmes for quite a while. Um, but we later learn, when he does finally bring Holmes back, in the adventure of the empty house, that Holmes survived the tumble into the Reichenbach Falls and headed out to, to Tibet, where he met the, you know, the Grand Lama, engaged in various sorts of researches in southern France, uh, did some exploration as a guy named Sigerson, and had numerous adventures before coming back to defeat his uh, enemy, uh, Colonel Sebastian Moran, uh, the second most dangerous man in London. Um, but my premise at the end of this talk was, we know now that Holmes survived the Reichenbach Falls. And we also know, if we read the, the canon, as we refer to the 56 short stories and four novels carefully, that Professor Moriarty had two brothers. One is a military man, another works on a railroad. So I premised that since Holmes survived the Reichenbach Falls, what is it more likely that, that so did Professor Moriarty. And with his two brothers, instead of going east, they went west to America. 
and slightly changing their name from Moriarty to Morley, founded an organization ostensibly <laughs> honoring their worst enemy, but in fact the front for an international crime syndicate. <laughs> wow, the BSI just ate this up. They were. <laughs> The next morning, I came down for breakfast at the Algonquin Hotel, which is where people usually stayed, and there was a letter waiting for me at the desk. I opened the letter. Inside, there's a note, and inside the note, there are five orange pips. <laughs> These are death threats in, in the Sherlock Holmes stories. And the note is, in fact, that I had discovered the secret of the Baker Street Irregulars and would have to be eliminated. <laughs> In fact, they invited me to become a member. I guess it's the Machiavelli theory, you keep your enemies close at hand. Uh, when, and when you, when you are invited to become a member of the, the actual national organization, you're given a name, a name chosen from the canon to harmonize with your personality or with your profession. The name I was given, as you already heard, was Langdale Pike. Who is Langdale Pike? He appears in just about the worst Sherlock Holmes story, <laughs> The Adventure of the Three Gables, a late story. And he is, in fact, a gossip columnist for London newspapers. <laughs> he sits in his, his bay window, and all the gossip of the city comes to him. But in the, in the middle of the, the, the story, Holmes turns to Watson. And he says, Watson, this is a case for Langdale Pike, and I am going to see him now. And then Watson explains how Holmes often consulted with Pike. And Pike, to me, is, is really a kind of uh, another one of these mastermind figures, like, like Professor Moriarty of crime, or Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock Holmes' older brother, who is a kind of human computer and sometimes is the British government. Um, and uh, I, I became fascinated by him. So I, in fact, wrote a kind of story about uh, Langdale Pike. It's, it, it's part of it, a shortened version of it is in this book. It's called The Case for Langdale Pike, in which I show that Pike is, in fact, the real mastermind behind the, the Sherlock Holmes uh, adventures and is in, uh, involved with half the fictional and historical characters of the same period. And is, for example, he's the, he's the real father of Winston Churchill, <laughs> since we've mentioned Winston Churchill <laughs> tonight. Um, Anyway, I, I, I found great pleasure in being a member of the Baker Street Irregulars and was soon in, uh, responsible for bringing the distinguished speaker in. I had John Barrett come to talk, uh, The Night in the Garden of Good and Evil, but he's also a great Sherlock Holmes fan. The, the artist, Gayan Wilson, you might know his cartoons from Playboy. Uh, I had done a number of Sherlock Holmes cartoons. I invited friends of mine to become, to come to the dinner and events eventually were invested. For example, uh, the science fiction and graphic novel writer Neil Gaiman. Uh, and a whole, uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful group of, of, of people that has been going on now for a long time. I should point out that for many, many, many years, it was only males, only men were in, allowed in the, the BSI and until about 30 years ago or so, maybe a little longer. A number of women formed a group called Ash, the adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes, and used to protest outside the dinner you know, the, in, in New York that they weren't allowed in. Eventually, the rules were changed. Women were allowed in. Most of the members of Ash, if not all of them, are now BSI members, too. But uh, 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 it's, uh, it's a, very, a very winning group. People of all sorts of walks of life, from judges to uh, cardiac surgeons, are members. I was once at, at a, a kind of late dinner there after the, the weekend banquets were over. We had, a number of us went out for Indian food. And I'm talking to this guy, I don't know. This is when I first joined. And I realized he owns Conan Doyle manuscripts, you know, the actual you know, stories. And I said, you know, what do you, do you do? You know, what do you do? And he says, oh, well, I, I was an engineer, but I'm retired. I said, well, what did, what did you used to work? And he sort of was coy, and finally he broke down. I said, well, I used to be chief technical officer for Apple, <laughs> which is where he got the money to, to, to buy these things. So there are lots of interesting people in the group. In the, in, the, in, the year, in the years, certainly before there were women involved, but even now, there's always a toast to the woman. As you recall, the first adventure of Sherlock Holmes, the first short story, is the a Scandal in Bohemia in which uh, Sherlock Holmes is defeated by Irene Adler, or Irene Adler, depending on how you want to say it. To Sherlock Holmes, she's always the woman. 
So at the, at the BSI banquets, we always, we always toast that year's the woman. It's a different woman each year. The first the woman was Gypsy Rose Lee, the famous stripper, um, back in the 1940s. Um, from, once I got involved with BSI, I started to explore more about Conan Doyle and came to know that, learn that he was really a remarkable writer, much beyond the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'd read these other things as a boy and started to, to learn that he was very much a public intellectual of his time. He was the president of the Divorce Law Reform Society. He was very active as a, you know, in, in, in writing to the newspapers to protest miscarriages of justice as he saw them. He wrote a very scathing letter about the atrocities in the Belgian Congo to the Times about how could England stand by and allow such things to happen. Uh, people who had been convicted and were sentenced to long terms in, in prison appealed to him and he helped uh, exonerate them. The uh, novel by Julian Barnes, Arthur and George, the novel he wrote before this year's Man Booker Prize winner, is about Arthur Conan Doyle and George Adalji. It was a, a Parsi Parsi extraction, but a lawyer who had been wrongly imprisoned for strange crimes. Um, so he also was a, a wonderful essayist. He has a book called Through the, Gold, Through the Magic Door about taking you into his library, and he just kind of chats with you about the books that, are, that mean a lot to him in a very easygoing and winning way. Uh, it would be a wonderful book for a young person. In fact, it was directed toward young people as a kind of sort of guide to reading. Um, very funny writer. Um, um, here's a passage. It's one of his great comic characters. It is Challenger in the, in the Lost World and the other stories. As you, as you remember, Challenger's um, the novels are, are, are told by Edward Malone, who's a journalist. They have um, they become friends over the course of the various stories. But in a late story called The Disintegration Machine. Malone goes to see Challenger, and um, Challenger comments on one of Malone's recent articles. You began a paragraph with the words, Professor G.E. Challenger, who is among our greatest living scientists. Well, sir, I asked, why these invidious qualifications and limitations? Perhaps you can mention who these other predominant scientific men may be, to whom you impute equality or possibly superiority to myself. It was badly worded. Later, I discovered that Conan Doyle also wrote contemporary novels. Um, there's one, The Tragedy of the, Car of the Carrasco. Carrasco is a ship, uh, where a group of Western tourists are seized by Middle Eastern terrorists and are, about, are going to be executed unless they convert to Islam. And it's, it's, a, it's a quite a thrilling story. Um, he wrote an early one about women's emancipation called Beyond the City, set in the suburbs, the new suburbs of London. And he, he offered, it's a comic novel, it's a light novel. So he has a comic figure as, as the, the, the chief woman character, but who is a very much an emancipated woman. Her name is Mrs. Westmacott. She becomes the heroine of the book, but. She's, there, there's a lot of humor in the description of her. When she first um, comes to, uh, comes to the, the suburbs, her neighbors, her new neighbors come to see her. There are a couple of spinsters, they're so-called spinsters. Two spinsters pay her a social call, and she asks if they would like some stout. I'm sorry that I have no tea to offer you. I look upon the subserviency of woman as largely due to her abandoning nutritious drinks and invigorating exercises to the male. I do neither. She picked up a pair of 15-pound dumbbells from beside the fireplace and swung them lightly about her head. You see what may be done on stout, said she. When the elder, Miss West Williams, protests that woman has a mission of her own, Mrs. Westmacott drops her dumbbells with a crash. The old cant, she cried, the old shibboleth. What is this mission which is reserved for woman? All that is humble, that is mean, that is soul killing, that is so contemptible and so ill paid that none other will touch it. 
All that is woman's mission. And who imposed those limitations upon her? Who cooped her up within this narrow sphere? Was it providence? Was it nature? No. It was the arch enemy. It was man. <laughs> and later on, the, the daughters of, the, of, of, of another neighbor are fearful that their widow or father is, is falling in love with Mrs. Westmacott and might marry her. And, and they decide to take women's suffragism to the limit so that her, their father comes home to find them, you know, sort of half dressed with champagne bottles all around and oyster shells and blue smoke in the room and their, their, their fiancés their nearby, just a, a picture of orgiastic abandon in the hopes that this will shock him into seeing what will happen to his poor daughters if he has anything more to do with Mrs. Westmacott. But she, of course, saves the day ultimately for everybody. Uh, he is really he's quite a wonderful writer. He's historical novels. Uh, the White Company used to be a great standard boys book for many years. Um, the Brigadier Girard stories are kind of tall tales told by an old soldier, Napoleonic soldier, as he looks back on his youth. Um, the wonderful memoirs, a terrific letter writer. He could turn his hand to anything. He was a very fluid writer. He never blotted a line. He could sit down and just write out his stories or his novels straight. Uh, people have manuscripts, they will, the, the, the setting manuscripts, there would be like one or two small word changes. They had very clear handwriting. Write, could write 40,000 words a, a week. It's about the length, about this book, it's a little more than 40,000 words. He um, opened his uh, ophthalmological practice in London. Um, he was a, trained as a doctor, and he had no patients that first day. So that day and the half of the next, he wrote a scandal in Bohemia. And waited a day or two and wrote the, you know, the next one. And another couple days later, he wrote his, The Speckled Band, or The Red-Headed League, rather. And I mean, he cranked out five of the major Sherlock Holmes stories within you know, three weeks of each other, and was sick for a while and be, and with the flu. And he was an astonishing fluid writer. But he wasn't the kind of writer who just stays at home, a kind of library cormorant sitting at his desk all the time. He was a great outdoorsman. He was trained as a doctor. Uh, spent time on a whaling uh, ship as a young man, and was a big guy. He was offered the job of becoming harpooner if he wanted to stay on with the ship rather than the ship's doctor, and um, was um, uh, you know a great cricket player, a terrific amateur billiards. Was asked to a, a judge at the World Championship boxing match in Reno, Nevada that year. Um, he, was, uh, introdu he introduced skiing from Scandinavia into Switzerland. Uh, he, was, he was very much a, a, a clubbable guy and not just somebody who wrote all the time. But he, he felt that literature shouldn't still ver virtues, values, and he saw his books as promoting kind of British ideals and sort of masculine, ch chivalric uh, principles and mo uh, models for, to, to, to young people and to, to readers in general. And, and this is in part why you know, Sherlock Holmes is a kind of uh, knight errant, just as uh, you know, f you know, Philip Marlowe was uh, described as uh, on these mean streets. Well, in this case, it was Baker Street, and he had a cape instead of a trench coat, but he's the same kind of figure. And Obviously, the, the greatest fictional creation of modern times, if not of all time. And everywhere the world over knows who, you know, people know who Sherlock Holmes is. He's been more filmed than any other uh, fictional character. There are more movies about him than anyone else. He's, he's very adaptable. You have, can have classic presentations of Sherlock Holmes. You can have parodic ones. You can, as we've seen this recently, the BBC has a wonderful series of Sherlock Holmes set in the 21st century. They translate very well. Instead of sending telegrams, Sherlock sends text messages. <laughs> and in the original stories, when, they, when he meets Watson in St. Bart's Hospital, he looks at Watson and says, you have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. And in the, in the, the modern 21st century one, he glances up at Watson and he says, Iraq or Afghanistan. And uh, they're, 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 very, they're, they're quite winning. They're younger in this 21st century uh, version, and, they're, and both uh, Holmes and Watson are real heartthrobs as well. And, that, and uh, you, you get the same effect well, in a gritty steampunk graphic novel version of uh, the Robert Downey Jr. 
vision of, of, of Sherlock Holmes in a movie that will be out in a couple of months, or sooner even, early December. Um, so he's, he's, he's a, you know, he can be reinterpreted in many ways and still survive. And, uh, you know, it's, he, he will always be Conan Doyle's greatest creation, and those stories will be, always be immortal. But I hope that my book will, besides being fun to read on its own, it's filled with anecdotes and passages from the Sherlock Holmes stories and thoughts about Sherlock Holmes and accounts of what happens at a BSI dinner and, and the like. And it, but I hope that my book will also be an invitation to, to explore beyond the Sherlock Holmes stories and, and to try some of his other books. I'm going to pause here and uh, ask if there are some questions. Otherwise, I can go rambling on some more. Yes? If it isn't too far off the subject, do we have enough information no. to make an educated guess as to what might have been the matter with Sir Arthur? What, what might have been the matter with Sir Arthur Donan Coyle's father? Father? Oh, his father, he came from a family of artists. Richard Doyle, his uncle, was a famous Victorian artist, and his father was also a fairly well-known artist, but apparently given to drink, apparently given to some sort of mental illness that led him to be committed um, to an asylum. I, there's never been any, any absolute uh, proof that he had any serious mental disease. Some felt that he almost got pushed there aside just because of the, the drinking and his general unpleasantness to be around as a way to, to park him someplace. He actually did some early illustrations of for the first Conan Doyle stories. By the way, the, you know, the Sherlock Holmes stories, which are so popular now, they didn't start off popular. His, he first wrote the novel Study in Scarlet. Nobody wanted it. And eventually, Beaton's Christmas Annual took it, and they waited a year before they published it in 1887. Uh, that issue of that magazine is probably the most valuable modern magazine. If you were to find a fine copy, it'd be worth probably a quarter of a million dollars. And there are only about 35 known. Um, but it was, it was well, high, well thought of, but it didn't attract any particular attention. And he probably would never have written about Sherlock Holmes again had he not received an invitation to go to a kind of publisher's lunch, actually a dinner, with a visiting editor from America who was the editor for Lippincott's magazine in Philadelphia, who took Conan Doyle as a rising young writer, because he wrote all sorts of things, he wrote these ghost stories and supernatural stories and historical fictions and the like. And another hot young writer, the two, two writers, out to dinner. And he wined and dined them and signed them both to books. So Conan Doyle wrote the second Sherlock Holmes story, The Sign of the Four. Uh, and the other writer, went on to write The Picture of Dorian Gray. It was Oscar Wilde. So that was a very successful uh, dinner for the guy from Lippincott's. Uh, but even that didn't attract that much attention. It was only when, he, when Conan Doyle started writing for Strand Magazine that the, the stories just took off like a flash, and there was just you know, instant mania for more Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, but they, they, the, the editors of the Strand recognized from the, from the very beginning that here was here was a master storyteller. So that you know, the editor once said he was the greatest natural-born storyteller of the age that he had ever, ever seen. And I think that's probably true, although I, I, I think maybe Kipling has an equal claim to that. Uh, Kipling is an incredibly varied artist as well. Um, but let me ask if there are uh, any more questions. Yes, sir. Is there anything about, it with, about his children in his books? Either not in his books, but what were the fields of his children? Oh. Did they carry anything from their from the, the father? Georgina Doyle was the daughter, one of the, daughter, the children of the first marriage. She's written a memoir of her family, of sort of the lost family, the first of Tui. Um, the, the more prominent children are the three from the second marriage. There were Dennis and Adrian Conan Doyle who were a couple of feckless, shiftless playboys, lived after their father's money, you know, lived in Switzerland, bought cars, got fat, chased women, and did all the things most of us would have done if we'd inherited a lot of money and no principles. Um, 
and they, they, were, they were really a pain, although um, they, they, they admired their father immensely. Um, they didn't want, they, they felt that he was in fact himself the model for Sherlock Holmes, that he was a, a, a perfect, gentle knicht knight, as uh, Chaucer might say, and they didn't like anyone saying anything against him. They, they, they were very suspicious of the Baker Street Irregulars and didn't like this idea of, of, of uh, that John Watson wrote the stories rather than Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, the third child, Jean Conan Doyle, became a, a general in the uh, Women's Air Force, married late in life, another general, and lived to only maybe, she died maybe 10 years ago, if that. And many friends of mine in the BSI, including John Lullenberg, I mentioned, knew her, knew her quite well. And she was apparently a wonderful lady and in every way, and very devoted to her father, but a, a great uh, supporter of, the, of, of Sherlockian studies and publications. Are there any more questions? Yeah, we're over here. Oh, yes, sir. The question is, what is my favorite film version of, of the Sherlock Holmes stories? Um, I, have, I like several of them. I, I, my, the first two of the Basil Rathbone movies, The Hound of the Baskervilles and The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, I think are both wonderful. They become more B-movie uh, uh, films in, in the later adventures, and they, they bring them, make them more and more contemporary. The, the, the Hound is really first rate, and The Adventures is a wonderfully expressionist cinematography at the end. Um, I'm a great admirer of the Jeremy Brett series from a while back, even though Brett um, emphasized a lot of the neurotic tics of, uh, of Holmes. Uh, most importantly, I think that the Brett series, the BBC Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch, and the Robert Downey series, where they're all wonderful in particular is in the, in the portraits of the depiction of Watson. Uh, at one point, Hercule Poirot in, in uh, the Agatha Christie Mysteries mentions about the great genius uh, she calls Maitre, and, he's, and someone says, you, you're referring to Sherlock Holmes? He says, no, I'm, I'm talking about Conan Doyle himself, and in particular, his greatest creation, Watson. And that... Um, <laughs> And there's something to this. We, we think of him, you know, from if you've seen the old movies, this bumbling dolt, Nigel Bruce. In fact, you know, Watson is, is the linchpin. He is our, the way we perceive Holmes. He is something of the straight man for the, the wonderful opening scenes in 221B where Holmes will wow him with some, you know, clever deduction, famously when they discover a hat left behind and, Watson makes all the wrong conclusions from the evidence of the hat, and Holmes goes through all these details about the owner of the hat and ends with the phrase, and it's obvious, of course, that his wife has ceased to love him. Uh, and uh, indeed, these are all, all, all the case, and he explains why. But Watson, you have to remember, is a doctor, he's been a soldier, he's been wounded in battle, he's the guy who brings his service revolver when they go out on adventures. Uh, he has an experience of women extending over three continents, several nations. He's married at least twice. Some, some irregular scholarship claims to detect five possible marriages in, in the course of Watson's life. And the stories themselves are really, in part, a long saga of how Watson humanizes this thinking machine. And he begins, he's very much this austere, analytical engine, and gradually becomes, is loosened up, becomes a much more warmer and endearing, and more human figure. And well, it's, it's, it's partly why we go back to these stories. When we're kids, we read for the excitement of the, of the adventure and for who done it. But when we're older, we know, you know, we know who, who's behind the Hound of the Baskervilles. We know what happens in the speckled band. But we, we, we go back there because these are also these wonderful comfort books. That, that here is that we go back to that gaslight and handsome cab era of when all seemed right with the world, when the world seemed writable, when we could, uh, you know, we, we, we in some ways return to our childhood. And the Sherlock Holmes certainly lives out 
many boys' dreams. You know, you get to live, in, live by yourself with your best friend. You have hot meals delivered by this mother figure. You can be as sloppy as you want in your house. Every, shoot into the walls. You can have adventures, you know, fighting crime. And, uh, and you just have a, you know, kowtow to nobody, live by your wits. I mean, who wouldn't want to be Sherlock Holmes? Um, there are even those, of course, who speculate that he, he had a romantic life and that uh, you know, he and Irene Adler were, were more than adversaries and you know, that Nero Wolfe is the product of that relationship. Um, uh, Baring Gould, W.S. Baring Gould, who wrote the first annotated Sherlock Holmes, there's a three-volume new annotated Sherlock Holmes done by my friend Les Klinger. Um, he has a view en say, a kind of a biography of, called Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street, in which the end, Holmes is dying, and his, he breathes his last word, and his last word is Irene. So uh, there, there, but these are all possibilities. The, the Baker Street Irregulars is, is, is full of fanciful explorations of, of, of the canon, of the figures in it, and it's, it's great fun to play this game of scholarship, and there are many books of it uh, available. And of course, the best possible book of the entire fall season devoted to Conan Doyle, this one right here, which, let me remind you again, is a perfect gift for all seasons. Thank you for coming. <laughs>